Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon. Sorry I've been away a while, but we are back. And in fact, we are so back because Trump has won the 2024 election. And that's what we'll be discussing today in some detail. For extra content, go to nickdixon.net where we're going to do an extra chunk and you'll get all my articles and full podcasts on nickdixon.net. It's only five quid. Help me save the West along with Donald J. Trump. And let me get on and introduce our guest. It's our old friend, here to dissect the election with us, star of GB News, Mr. Paul Cox. How you doing, Paul? Hey, Nick. What a day. What a what day. What a night. A great but, day. But, but great great day, great times. Um, we, You and I have been, I mean, we've been in contact for what feels like at least 24 hours non-stop now, just you know, messaging in the dark <laughs> I'm, hours. I'm so of, sorry. Secretly. It, not, nothing secret about it. We were both on Twitter at the same time, enjoying ourselves. It, it's like, um, oh, it just... You know, it's 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 beyond politics now, isn't it? And I'm starting to wonder if I'm enjoying the Schadenfreude or whatever it is a little bit too much. You know, when you see mate this getting all upset and uh, the rest is politics, boys. <laughs> oh, it's so good. We'll go into all of that. And by the way, we did try and start this podcast about an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> we had some technical difficulties. With someone trying to log into Riverside, it doesn't matter who. <laughs> and um, and uh, so imagine yeah how the energy would have been. So we're going to try this on Zoom and see if yeah. it's, see if it's fine. I'm sure it's fine, but just to, just flagging for the listener and viewer, it may not be exactly the same as normal for all the autists out there. But we're going to give it a crack. And yeah, let's start with how it played out. Actually, Paul, on the on the night. I mean, I was watching on Twitter and and I was trying to watch every single thing at once. I was actually offered to go on Lotus Eaters, but I couldn't make it. I felt a bit guilty. Sorry, Carl. Thank you for the offer. Um, wasn't asked to go on GB News, though I noticed somehow Lewis Schaefer ended up on there. I, 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 was, I was stunned. I was, any thoughts Did you watch on that? Any that won't get us sack? I, I, you told me he was on. And so I clicked on just to check if it was a joke. And I was like, what the fuck is Lewis doing there? Like, I mean, like, it's the most serious night of the year. You get. Have he, they watched him? Have they watched any of Lewis? <laughs> remarkably, as the night went on, there was a there was a commentator, left wing commentator. I think you may have even debated him at the Battle of Ideas. Um, but Lewis was winning debates, um, genuinely winning debates, and arguing relatively cohesive and coherent arguments from the perspective of pro Trump. Uh, because he is anti team world and as is as is Donald Trump. So uh, when the when the evening first started, you know, at uh, one o'clock, he hadn't quite warmed up. He hadn't finished a sentence. Probably didn't finish a sentence in the first hour. Uh, just kept just kept double just kept reviewing himself like he forgets he's on live TV, saying things like uh, it, almost sort of saying things like "This is my worst show ever." Then realizing he's never done that show before, and also none of the other panelists know know quite what to expect. So what you saw is this kind of coming together of all the other panelists as they realized after the first hour, and they they were on for four hours, that Lewis was this kind of oddball anomaly. And uh, once they were on board, and he started to make good coherent arguments, which I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen before. So perhaps. Between the hours of three and four is is when Lewis is at his best. I love that that's like a surprising achievement. That's the minimum that he's there to do, Paul. He actually managed to make good... That's why he's on the TV. <laughs> he actually ma no, he managed to speak. There were words coming out. He, you could see him. I'm like, yeah, this is the minimum. It's so annoying. No one asked me to do it. Yeah, there was a guy on. I don't know if it was the same guy. There was a guy on. I just flicked on at one point. It was a guy I debated at the... Uh, at the debate from the Battle of Ideas, which you can now get um, it's out on YouTube, go to my Substack, nitdixon.net. And, you know, I smashed that debate and I'm like, but no one asked me to do it, except Lotus Eaters, which is great, the great they asked. But then you go on and it's like, Lewis is on. Anyway, so I was flicking around, I saw that, I was like, that's ridiculous. I watched BBC just to see what was going on there. People kept, I noticed one thing is people kept telling me, oh, no, they haven't called Georgia, they haven't called North Carolina, they haven't called, et cetera, Pennsylvania. And I'm like, well, why do I know about it then? And why have I been right every time? So basically, Twitter was calling things an hour, an hour and a half before mainstream yeah. media. And you're like, mainstream media is so pointless now because they've got to like probably like triple confirm it or something so they don't get sued or something. Whereas Twitter is just like, boom, Georgia. And people were saying to me, like friends of mine and also just randos on Twitter, go, uh, no, it hasn't been called. I was like, it's been called. I've just fucking called it. I like, I was like calling Pennsylvania. I called it. Yeah, I've called <laughs> it because it's been called. 
So there, there was but a also, massive lag with mainstream media. Come on. We were able to see the total number of votes available within, you know, combined of of the councils, what they call them, at, at the boroughs or whatever, in, <laughs> in each state. We were able to see the to- what the total would be, how many had been called, how many had been called so far, therefore what the percentage was, and what was left. So, so there'll be times in the night where uh, it's ninety three percent have been, you know, been counted, and Trump is two hundred thousand ahead, and you know there's one hundred and forty left to to count, and you're like. Well, that's that for Trump then, isn't it? And then you'd wait and wait and wait. And you think, what are they doing? And I was starting to think, are they, you know, they're going out the back, they're looking for big bags of ballot papers. <laughs> Gas I, don't know what I don't know what they're doing. Um, but he, from very early on, you could see that within each borough of each state, he was outperforming himself in 2020. Kamala Harris, now, of course, you know, that name's going to fade into obscurity. We're never going to hear from her again, because uh, she never won a primary. She wasn't really a, uh, the candidate. And as a candidate, she was rubbish. Uh, and now she's gone. You know, we haven't even heard from her. Maybe she's gone already. Maybe she never speaks again. I don't know. Maybe she just puts a tweet saying, I'll give it a go. See you later. I, she didn't I, come I, out, I did she? Unless she's come out today, because we, while we've been fanning around with tech we've stuff. We've done a good two hours of trying to figure out tech. Yeah, so, so maybe. she might have come out. But she didn't come out, did she? She, she, she just didn't show up. No, she didn't. It was reminiscent of Hillary Clinton. Um, although this this time the, the supporters were just you know rejected and left. Like in in twenty sixteen, it was much more sort of shock, shock and awe, as uh, George W. would say. But did you see Candace Owens? She really pulled the Hillary Clinton and is going to bear display of weakness uniquely demonstrated by female contenders. Only a woman can really say that, but uh, yeah, she she just did the slinking off thing, disappeared. Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, Kamala Harris is nothing, which means that she didn't lose because she's Kamala Harris. She lost because she was just the face of a deeply corrupt and disturbed political machine that disparages Americanism and Americans. Election 2024 was revenge of the normies. So, I mean, I wouldn't put it as normies, but yeah, I mean, I agree with the first bit. I said she'll fade. She's she'll fade into obscurity. Just which is probably more interesting than going through the media. But I just wanted to finish on that. Did you? Look at any because I was trying to flick through every single possible one. Channel Four was just like, now we're going to Rufus Wainwright. It's like, <laughs> this, do you mean the what? the singer but that was just... famous twenty years ago? Why, why are we going to Rufus Wainwright? I'd be like, oh yeah, I hate it's bad. It's like what the fuck. And then, <laughs> and then they're like BBC way behind. ITV had a great moment where they they interview some guy. Trump's winning. They get an advisor on. I can't remember who it was. They get this advisor on. Trump advisor. And they say to him, so if Trump loses, you know, will he accept the result? It's like, it's like, oh, why are you asking me that? Like, states are coming in. We're winning. We're doing so well. You asked me that. Would you ask that of the Democrats? Why are you asking that? He got so annoyed. He goes, I waited here. And then at the end of the interview, he goes, I stood here for fucking 20 minutes. <laughs> and then it goes back to the guy in the studio. He's I like, saw that. Um, well, obviously, oh, yeah, obviously uh, it's late, you know, sorry, language. It's like, but why were you asking him? Will Trump accept? He's winning. He's fucking winning. <laughs> what, what, yeah, exactly. It was never going to, you know, and there was a time by about, I would say, 3 a.m. where all predictions were pointed to Trump. He was winning on all fronts, ahead on all fronts, and all the swing states were going in his favour. This time, unlike 2020, there was no sort of talk of... Postal vote. Well, I guess we forget 2020 was during the height of COVID. So there was a a much, I'm assuming, I've not seen the statistics today. I can't, I, I don't think I could spell my name if you ask me at this point. I feel like I've been away for weeks, but I've not seen the statistics on postal voting, but I assume it was much larger in 2020. So there was this point in 2020 in the middle of the night where you could see that Trump was perhaps ahead in the counting. But the postal votes hadn't been counted yet, and that, and there were just these huge swings towards the Democrats. There was none of that last night, and I think most people recognised that early on that wasn't going to be a factor. I was, I, I, I didn't scoot around too much. I stayed within Twitter, GB News, essentially within my echo chamber, um, and relied on the balances those things provided. If there was any, there was definitely balance on on GB News. I thought, however. As it became clearer, like just before Pennsylvania, once George, you know, uh, North Carolina and Georgia were in, and the prospects for uh, for Pennsylvania were really good, 
then I started to go out to like Channel Four and BBC, and the rest is politics. Just to get the meltdown. Just, yeah, just to, just because I know it's terrible, and I'm not even sure if I'm if I'm happy to say this, but it's exactly what I thought. I thought now's the time to go and have a look. What are they thinking? And then sort of doing that thing where I was looking back at tweets. Rory, yeah, famously Rory Stewart, just a day before, had, had said Kamala Harris is going to win, and listed the whole reasons why he thought so. Every single which one have been proved wrong. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? Go comprehensively. On. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to say it yet, but you've you, you've you've naturally led us into my thread of losers. So I would like to go. Over. This has got currently, as we record, uh, it's got one point six million views, two twenty five thousand likes. So this is a banger on my Twitter. And I'm not reading this because it's my own Twitter guys just posting. Although, if there was a day to boast about yourself, it would be today because that was in honor of Trump. Are we yeah. both also drinking Diet Coke in honour of the yeah. big man? Yeah, Absolute yeah, that's what legend. we do. I've got uh, um, a burger down here as well. Yeah, yeah, we've got a McDonald's, we've got a Diet Coke. <laughs> so I just said, thread of losers, starting with Rory Stewart, classic UK elite bobble delusion, needs to end his podcast immediately. And he said Kamala Harris will win comfortably because Biden's admin has been solid. What? Trump's lost ground since 2016. Exact opposite. The young black male votes which Trump needs didn't turn out in 16, 18, 20 or 22. Non whatever they did this time. Young women like Kamala and Vo ignore polls they're herding after past misses. Well, ignore polls, yes, but he was completely wrong. I had another one from Joe Walsh who got it completely wrong. He's going to lose. It hit me for the first time this morning. He said, I just spoke to two folks who voted, to him in, voted for him in 2016, 2020. They're, they're done now. It's like, oh, well, that must be it then, Joe. You're two folks. There was a guy <laughs> called Mike Madrid. Trump knows he's going to lose. He's rallying his base for violence. Anyway, I had this whole thread, Scaramucci, is that his name? Yeah. Maria yeah, Shriver, he was on the rest Carol of his politics, talking shit. Oh, really? Yeah. All wrong. Alistair Campbell, Elon Musk getting more and more desperate as reality bites. Trump is losing and he knows. Bullshit. And then another one from Rory. He was so confident. He did another one against Andrew Neil saying, uh, Kamala Harris, it won't be close and Kamala Harris will win. Um, in extraordinary. And so I just done a great thread of just, as you say, Schadenfreude, all these people. And it is great. It is a great moment. We, it's already a great moment, Paul. And then we're just being given these little gifts, like Ian Dunt. This is the darkest morning for Ukraine, <laughs> for the US, for all of us. I was like, Ian, we're already enjoying it. Just You're just giving us caviar now. You're just spoiling <laughs> us. With these tweets, Ambassador, you are really spoiling us. I mean, James O'Brien, what fresh hell is this? Savor these moments, guys. These are the moments. <laughs> it's Purely... not just about Schadenfreude. It's just, that's just the cherry on the top, right? Yeah. And you know what? Uh, people, I mean... What they call them normies. I'm not sure. That was Shapiro, wasn't it? He called them normies. Uh, it's difficult to know. Uh, one thing I will say is quite clearly that there was a gender split. Quite clearly, there was a race split towards Trump as well. And I heard a Democrat commentator on one of the American channels say, if you think white men hate black women, wait till you find out how much black men hate black women and he <laughs> that was that was on the democratic democratic side now within that is an element of truth and the truth being that the only game that kamala played was that was two elements to it one she wasn't donald trump and b she just broke everyone down into these silos of well you know what their skin color was what their sexuality was how they'd like to organize their genitals all this sort of stuff that no one outside of that echo chamber cares about whatsoever. Totally neglected any policy. Started talking about Trump and his supporters as Nazis. Um, obviously, Biden uh, denies this, but he called them all garbage. And it took some serious jiggery pokery to try and convince us that he didn't say that when he clearly did. And this is the problem, you know. It, we've now got speakies. Um, Biden, he's like, it's like he's talking into a camera, he doesn't realise it's being recorded. And then when we play it back to him and his people, he's like, oh, I didn't say that. It's like, I'm afraid he did. And we've got it all on camera. But it, they, they, what they didn't, it was just the battlegrounds were all immigration and the economy. So they, they said, do you like lots of illegal immigration? And Kamala said she's going to do nothing about it and went on about how skin colour makes people wonderful. Trump said, yeah, we're going to need to do something about this and we need to make the economy, econ economy better and link the two things together. And it was just simple 101 politics in the end. Yeah. And he just, he was just able, what he was able to do, I mean, take the Joe Rogan podcast. 
not many political commentators around the world can just go on to a three-hour podcast and just chew the fat for three hours. Irrespective of what he said, what the content was, he was very coherent and he did talk about policy. He did a little bit of wandering, but he's, he's quite famous for that. But could, could you have seen Kamala do that? She was probably, she, I don't know what she is, 30 years is, is, is junior. Absolutely no chance. She would have, yeah. she would have been in bits. The, but, the election would have been over then and there. So yeah. the left won't learn. I, I'm almost certain the left won't learn. And what we'll do is they'll just do more of the same and they'll fall into the trap and they'll spend four years calling Donald Trump a Nazi and then he'll sail off into the sunset because he no longer needs to do this anymore. He can't do it anymore. And um, he'll leave the Republican Party uh, to fend for themselves. And I'm sure the Democrats are going to do exactly the same thing. They'll probably be talking about Donald Trump for another 25 years, long after his death, we saying he's into... come back from the dead. We can go into predictions. But first, I just want to say, I mean, they've won. I mean, it looks like it's 312 votes for Trump at time of recording and winning the popular vote and winning the Senate. And it looks like they've won the House. I mean, that seems to be official. I can't quite believe it, but it seems that way. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, that's everything. I the mean, the only thing I read this morning that it hasn't quite achieved was this 60 seat majority you need to prevent the filibuster. Right. I think I don't need to explain what the filibuster is uh, to the listeners of this podcast, but essentially that would just, you know, the quagmire that will ensue inevitably now. However, when you've got the House and the Senate, um, you've got a good chance of getting things through anyway. But if you could, if you had that 60 seat majority, and maybe somebody will prove, prove me wrong, but I think it's in that order, you can essentially uh, get most of your policies through in the same way that a Labour government, government with a huge... Um, uh, majority is able to do also people are but, saying you know how that will they abolish the filibuster now will they whether how are they going to use it yeah they'll try everything they can but that is a but just appreciate the crushing nature of the victory i mean it's absolutely crushing and it's so opposite as we've said to all the uk media bubble and if you stood back though and, and just assessed it calmly you were able to predict this i mean you can check all the receipts on my Twitter. For example, when Kamala first replaced Biden, they were like, oh, no, it's going to be tough for Trump. How will he approach it? I'm like, no, she's she's shit. Then it was like, Kamala's brat. It's like empty media nonsense. Nothing doesn't mean anything. Oh. Then it was, um, there was, like, it was a whole slew of things. There was the, later there was the Puerto Rico joke, where again, I was like, doesn't matter. In 2016, Trump said the famous locker room talk. We heard Trump himself on a recording say, and everyone's like, that's the end. But as Biden said at the time, 100% metaphysical certitude, you win, sir. 100% meta And he was like, it's not 100%. He's like, 100% metaphysical certitude. He's like, people don't care. They care about their jobs. They don't care about this locker room talk. And they didn't. And I said it this time. I was like, I never wavered in any of these things because I just had a very cool head about it. Every time they said, oh, oh Vance was another one. It was like, oh, Vance is a bad choice. And how will he stack up against Harris? I was like, not a problem. Wrong. And every time I was right because I just... Not that I'm bragging, but I just I just stayed the course and just didn't think about these distractions because think, you could never get away from the fundamental thing. H Harris was such a weak candidate; oh, she didn't win anything. She couldn't win a primary. She had nothing about her. She was dumb. She, as you said, she couldn't do interviews, let alone a three-hour interview. Versus Trump, an all-time American icon, most famous man in the world, charisma off the charts, just nothing he can't do. Can't be killed by bullets. Can't be stopped. He didn't lose 2020. Once you realise he never lost, it all makes sense. He, I never, and I've said that, of course, the whole time. It was a very, a very a, you could say, okay, COVID made it a weird election. If you wanted to be generous about the voting machines, you could just say, okay, COVID made it a freak election. And you could also say the extraordinary control of media shutting down the Hunter Biden laptop story. There's enough things to say. It's Even if you don't go for the actual rig, it's basically rigged anyway. So anyway, yeah. you come back and he did a Grover... Cleveland, which I love that name. It's the most American name ever. Yeah, I said it's like being called Chad Miami. It's like he did the Grover Cleveland non-consecutive terms. And even Ben Shapiro, based on that, said, based on that and everything else, admitted, he goes, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a great man of, of history. He's, he's a global figure for our time. He's, yep, there's, there's no way. And it's like, this is a never Trumper who has always hated Trump, still doesn't like him as a person, finally got on board this time, had him on his show, even funded it, you know, even contributed to his campaign. Even Shapiro, once never Trump, is just going, yeah, he's all the things he said, I, I, I give up. Yeah, that's not been spoken about enough, really. Uh, there are a lot of never Trumpers that have 
America never Trump as that is that have come on board and voted this time round. Um, and they've done so based on policy, I think, to some degree, but 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 overwhelmingly because of the persecution of Trump in the last four years. So what they've seen is the Democrats say they're the party of um, fair play, whilst trying to bankrupt Trump, trying to jail Trump, dragging him through the courts, making it difficult for him to campaign, uh, having him, not directly, um, but his supporters trying to assassinate him, he has gone through hell and back and held himself with great decorum, actually. I mean, even yesterday, long before we knew what it was, I was looking at him thinking, I'm not sure how at his age he stands, he stays quite as composed as he is. We've got to, you know, the last nine and a half years, 2015 or whenever it was when he first came on the scene politically, um, and we we're all a bit like... This is hilarious. How is this going to work out? And of course, it did in 2016, and we saw how that played out. And 2020 was, I don't know, iffy. You know, he, he made a lot of fuss about it, but there was a few things that weren't quite right. Bannon and his rant that you showed me, by the way, I'd, uh, you'd probably recommend people to see uh, Bannon's rant. But uh, he's oh, yeah. still angry about the 600,000 votes that seem to manifest themselves um, during counting. However, I think people, the never Trumpers that came on board saw. Trump had policies versus no policies whatsoever for Kamala. She was just a DEI uh, candidate. She was she was a woman of colour. And that is what they were asking the American public to vote for. And, of course, it really doesn't mean anything that. It means, in fact, it means less than nothing. You know, someone's skin colour, um, how they brush their hair or which order they like their genitals in or where they like to put their genitals at night, it's actually of no consequence. You make it sound like they put them in a little drawer yeah. where they like to put their genitals at night. Just tuck them away in a little box, little air, family heirloom. I just tuck them away, put my balls in a in a little uh, this little little music velvet, box. I've got. Velvet cushioned box. <laughs> Have you seen Granddad's balls? Um, it, it would it would be it was quite something. But all these things that they built up make no difference whatsoever. She didn't challenge him on any policy. She just went, he's bad. He's worse than bad, actually. Do you remember the Nazis? He's a bit like them, but worse. No evidence, but of course everybody's gone through with that. And you see, you see them quoting it all throughout the liberal left-leaning media throughout the evening. Well, of course he can't win because of, you know, reeling off all the things that yeah. he said out of context, by the way. And yes, he says some crazy shit. But in a time where everything is crazy. The man who is most honest about the crazy shit wins. And that's exactly yeah. what happened to some degree. You know, he he just went straight at it. That you could you could buy into him. And he you know, he won the popular vote. He won the popular vote. It was the first Republican pro, um president to have done so since 2000, 2004. So that would have been George W. Um, so he's not he's not only one that obviously he's he's, got, he's president elect now he's won the popular vote he's got the senate in the house I mean it's pretty much a clean sweep and I'm really uh, perhaps you were going to come on to this Nick but I am so pleased it's a clean sweep so decisive we, there is no doubt there is no doubt that he was voted for overwhelmingly to be the president of the United States and that's exactly what it'll be for the next four years and we haven't got to do any of this well you know what oh yeah of course none of that. It's all yeah. put to bed. There's yeah. nothing they can say, and they've just got to suck it up. Sorry, there's just so many things I want to reply on. I've just looked at a graph here. It actually comes from... It's uh, it's US presidential election popular vote Democrat versus Republican in millions. And you see that they've, they've, they've smashed it, but they've smashed it, the Republicans, in a kind of realistic way, whereas the Dems have the same popular vote 2012, 2016, and 2024, but 2020, it's just massively, massively high. And you're just like, big question mark. Um, another thing, you talk about race, white women, I'm not going to say all is forgiven, because there's a lot, but some is forgiven, because 69% white women voted Republican. And there was all this talk, you know, they won't, you know, they're lib white liberal women, but I did notice there was a big shift. I noticed when hot girls could say that they'd voted Trump, that was a big shift, because in 2016, no one could admit it, and it was terrible. You see these like OnlyFans models. Yeah, we love Trump. And you're like, that's a huge change. Megyn Kelly, 
who Trump, of course, had the, these famous moments with the Rosie O'Donnell. Was it that was her, wasn't it? And the and there was the blood coming out of her wherever there was. He had these moments with that was Megyn Kelly, wasn't it? Or I can't remember. The, anyway, Trump had these clashes with Megyn Kelly uh, back in 2016, but Megyn Kelly came on stage and actually endorsed him, which was extraordinary. Yeah, blood coming out of her wherever he had these these clashes with her uh, in 2016, but that's she she did a full turnaround. So women actually did get on board, or at least white women. Now, black women, who I always said, they're the only people that like Kamala Harris. They were still 90% Harris. But yeah, men, 74%. White men, 74%. White women, 69% Trump. Black men, 16%. So they came across to some degree. Latino men, 45% to Republicans. So that Very is a cool. big, that's a big difference. Yeah. And um, so there you go. It, a few other things you mentioned. I mean, just the, the, on the delusion side, yeah, people like Rory Stewart sitting there, you know, talk about, you know, he goes, well, had Trump have had 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 Kamala one, you could have made a, a different case for it, and you'd have pointed out the the uh, convicted felon and and uh, co- cause an insurrection. It's like, yeah, but Rory, he didn't cause an insurrection, and the convicted felon thing is just people like you saying he's a convicted felon and who happened to work in the justice system, but he's actually that didn't go anywhere. These people seem to think these are like spells they can that they can say things and they become reality. But actually, America's looking at it going. This is nonsense. He's not a felon. We like this guy. He didn't do an insurrection. That's bollocks. They think they can just keep saying it. And, and as you say with Rogan, Trump doing Rogan is the moment many people see, at least a symbolic moment where the shift to new media truly happens. And the legacy media just look ridiculous. It's like they just have these lies. They're completely ossified. It doesn't pertain to reality anymore. And people can see that and they voted accordingly. Just quickly on the Bannon rant as well. Yeah, I, I saw it live. It was incredible. And I've, I've shared it on my Twitter, and he's just like, he's like, we we want to know what happened to those six hundred thousand, and we and Donald Trump, he, he's a good-hearted person, but but we're not, <laughs> we, are, we are coping. He's basically like, yeah, Trump's too nice, but I'm not, and I've been, and then I was like, as his anger built, I was like, what's going on here? And I was like, oh yeah, Bannon just got out of prison. He's just yeah. been in prison. I mean, Peter Navarro was put in leg irons. I mean, Giuliani was hounded, Bannon in prison, Trump hounded with lawfare. It's like. There is retribution coming. You can't behave like this with no karma. I'm sorry, you just, yeah, you just can't. And I think I'd like, I'd still like to see him act. And I think he has done with his speech, by the way. But I'd like him to continue to act with decency. I'd like him to kill a lot of this with kindness. He can do. We're going to say things. something else. Like kill, <laughs> kill yeah. all his enemies because I would like to see his enemies imprisoned, exiled, <laughs> end all elections. He does everything that they fear. Full dictator. That's what I want to see. But you're more moderate than me. Well, uh, the reason is I think there's a game still to be played, a political game. So he can still do all of the things he wants to do. He can pardon himself. And obviously on the 26th of November, he was due, I think, to be sent to, or charged. Also, I, I forget now. I'm so tired. Um, 26th of November is also my birthday. That's why I remembered it. But the, he, he was due back in court for something. And it was looking like, you know, it, it wasn't good for Trump. He'll pardon himself now. He can do all that sort of stuff. He'll never go to jail now. He just needs to do these four years and he'll be absolutely fine. And the history books will remember him quite well. It'd be interesting to see what he does in terms of the wars. I mean, there are, I've actively seen people complaining that he might stop the Ukrainian war. That's the angle I believe they keep coming. Have you heard he might stop the Ukrainian war because he seems to have a relationship with Putin? And you're like, and, and, I, and, I, and every time I see this, I'm like, is that supposed to be bad? So it, <laughs> they'll yeah. take everything out of context and say, it, uh, he said Putin's a genius. Yeah, have you... Smart have you guy, back? smart cookie. We get out. We, we, he loves me. But yeah, that's just, that's just his diplomacy, isn't it? He? he flatters people. It's fairly... I don't know why people can't see that. It's like, yeah, it's a straightforward, his di- diplomatic tactics. You know, I guess we all do it from each side of the aisle, don't we? We all play... We all take um, a phrase or a word or a saying somebody said and, and use it against them, it seems... It seems, you know, all fair in, in love and war and politics, I guess. But it, with Trump, they seem to just take it completely literally without really any evidence. I mean, he did do four years in the White House. It'll be really interesting to see now if somehow he manages to resolve the Ukraine conflict. I mean, obviously, Leo Kurtz would be gutted because that is his biggest hobby. I mean, I, yes, I I, I'm not I... even sure Putin or Zelensky know as much as Leo Kurtz about the Russian-Ukraine war. Um, yeah, true. Um, Leo knows all the names of all the drones. Yeah, you know, our colleague Leo Kurse at GB News, he really does love the Ukraine thing. And, and you're right, he'll be gutted. I mean, there was a guy in my, it was only, this is anecdotal, of course. There was a guy who came over and played a couple of games in our football team. 
and he was from Ukraine. Is is uh, he didn't want to come out here, but his he said he was trying to save his marriage because his daughter and wife had come out. Whereas he had a fairly sort of important role in Ukraine and didn't really want to come over. He felt that Trump would pause the war rather than end it. And of course, one does wonder you get another load of neocons back in charge, and maybe they do start it up again. But it's definitely bad news for, for Zelensky. I mean, there was that moment when Zelensky was there and he says, you know, we have a great relationship, but I also have a great relationship with Putin. And Zelensky's standing right there and he goes, oh, but, but ours is better. Like, it was just like embarrassing. But um, yeah, he definitely wants to end that. And it's bad Middle news. East. In... Huh? Middle East, sorry, Nick. I mean... Middle East. And that's the other so... thing. Now, that's the, that's the curveball because how how pro-Israel is Trump is the question. Now, some will be saying, well, he, yeah, he's very pro-Israel, Nick. And actually, the, the sort of fringes of the kind of Nick Fuentes fringe were even saying, he's trying to claim credit now annoyingly, but he was saying vote against Trump. And that's why you really lose. That's why I get really angry when it's like, okay, you hate Israel. I understand it. But you've taken it to the point of you want to vote against Trump. It's just like, no, I'm I'm in a place where I'm like, I, I obviously have a cult like devotion to Trump. And I've been very clear about that since day one, whilst also recognizing, yeah, it's not perhaps ideal how ridiculously pro Israel is, in my opinion. And obviously, you know, I, I started off relatively okay with Israel. The more I've had to work with Zionists, the, the more I've... Uh, change my mind <laughs> but um, but uh the, i'm just i'm not i'm not convinced that i don't like this you know israel first stuff i don't like all this i mean shapiro is interesting because he was very anti-trump then you see trump do the kind of rabbi tour you go around you touch the wall and everything and then eventually picture was like oh, okay but if you're not if you're an american who's just more of an isolationist not that you're pro-palestine you're just like ah, i'm not that bothered about israel then yeah maybe that's tricky but but trump He's very anti-Warhawk, as we know with the recent Liz Cheney comments. He's very anti-neocon expansionist wars. And in a similar way, even though he's very pro-Israel, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, etc. But because he's Trump, will he be very hawkish still? Or will he even say to Israel, chill out, lads? I'll tell you what he puts above everything else, the US economy. Right. And the US tariff, economy... The most beautiful word, Joe, tariff. tariff. <laughs> he, and he, yeah, he absolutely like, he just genuinely loves it. Now he's just won an election based on building, rebuilding the economy back to where he left it essentially. So in order for him to do that, you know, stopping a couple of very expensive wars, or at least reducing the cost of those very expensive wars, is you know going to be a boost to his economy immediately. So it's it's difficult to see whether he is ideologically opposed to the wars or not, but he is ideologically in favour of building the US economy again. And famously, there were no new wars in the four years that Donald Trump was in uh, the White House between 2016 and 2020. And it'll be interesting to see what happens now because what you're gonna see, particularly from the left, is um, all the all, all the do-gooding, be kind people will get upset if he stops war. So he'll, let's say he stops the Iraq Ukraine, the Ukraine war in some way. Maybe he draws a line and says, look, you know, Zelensky, you've got to give some, and Putin, you can't go any further. That would probably put a page to the war um, and would stop death and would stop people funding it. Now, I can, I can imagine when this goes out, there'll be people screaming at the screen, what about, what about, what about? But that would put page to the war and, you know, and, and they could move on and they could build their economy. The same applies in the Middle East to some degree. He just has to say to Israel, what do you want? We want our hostages back. He goes to the other boys, and he probably walks into them themselves, goes down the tunnel, you know, picks out a couple of hostages, brings them back out, one on the back of Musk, one on the back of uh, Joe Rogan or something. They come out, they go, there's your hostages, end of the war, we're going to build the economy back at home. And, you know, he's going to do the same with NATO in Europe. There's a lot of people in Europe at the moment scaremongering, saying, oh, my God, he's not going to support us any further. Well, what he's saying really is, is you've got to pay your own way. And we all do this. If you don't do this at home for your own family or for yourself, then you're a fool. So all he's doing that is on a, on a national scale. Mm. So I don't really see that he's doing, he's doing too much uh, wrong there whatsoever. The tariffs thing is really interesting. The reason it's really interesting is, you know, we've got this unique relationship with the US. And he might not apply those tariffs to the UK, but I'll tell you why he might. If you've got Lammy Lamb Chops as Foreign Secretary and Keir Starmer and all the other wet flannels who have said the most abhorrent things out loud about Donald Trump uh, mm. are now in a position where they've got to negotiate with him, that's going to be very tricky for us. Oh, yeah. And what's going to be even more tricky is the people who support Labour and Starmer and Lamb Chops 
and Dawn Butler and the other CEOs of the grievance industry in the UK, they are going to have to they are going to have to p- pick a side, and the side they're going to end up choosing will be anti UK because they always do. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I mean, Lammy, even though he said these appalling things about him, allegedly Trump likes Lammy. You know, because Lammy is quite good at kind of yucking it up and getting. He yeah, they went to dinner and apparently he got on best with Lammy and likes him. Trump's a forgiving guy. Maybe he's forgotten. Maybe he doesn't know it's the same guy. You know, you, you can imagine that. And Starmer, one of the very, very few things Starmer's done that's good. Of course, he did that. He, well, it wasn't really Starmer, but Labour did that terrible thing of sending over the people to campaign for Harris, which they're going to have to massively play down. Yeah. But Starmer himself was very shrewd to call Trump after the assassination, knowing that he loves, you know, flattery. He loves people that seem to care about him. That was an important move, I felt. And he now has put out this. Congratulations, President-elect Donald Trump, on your historic election victory. I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. That's the tweet. And then the message itself says, congratulations, President-elect Trump, on your historic election victory. It says the same thing. As the closest of allies, we stand shoulder to shoulder in defense of our shared values of freedom, democracy, and enterprise. From growth and security to innovation and tech, I know that the UK-US special relationship will continue to prosper on both sides of the Atlantic for years to come. So he put out a sort of good message very, I mean, yeah, basic, but Starmer could, could even fuck that up potentially. But he, he actually managed not to. It sounds but... like he's got some good advisors, Starmer, on this, on this geopolitics international relations front. It's just a shame the... we gone. It's just a shame we have to have Starmer instead of Farage. I was saying that Trump should announce his victory on the night and also tell Starmer to step down. And in the <laughs> UK, Starmer needs to step down. We like <laughs> Nigel. Is he? He's here. Ni- Where's Nigel? We like Nigel. I just. <laughs> The and man he did from Brexit. Europe. It's called. They call it Brexit, folks. Beautiful word. I just think it'd be great if he just. But he will annoyingly have to sort of get on with Starmer. But wouldn't it be great? I mean, Jenrick and and Trump would have been good. Farage and Trump would be would be great. Starmer and Trump. It's an odd one, isn't it? It is an odd one, and uh, this is what's going to happen now for the for the rest of both those terms. Is uh, we are going to be mired in proxy socialism socialism adjacent some other what you know basically any way they can squeeze socialism into the uk economy they will do so on this side and it's not going to be compatible with what donald trump's gonna gonna want to do worldwide um he might let us stand on our own two feet a bit more as well i'm hoping that that means that he does a good trade deal with us that's the most important thing it feels like if we had a very good relationship with donald trump we could build a trade deal um, with the US that would that would support us for generations to come. Now, of course, if you lift the drain on that, people will say it's you know bloated chickens fed on water or whatever. I'm not quite sure. You, re- you remember that as soon as you get close to a deal like that, you get every idiot and their uncle come out going, "Well, yeah, but if you see what the, what this means in food sales, whatever it might mean." Um, and of course, those things are worth looking at. It's just the people who talk about it tend to be idiotic, uh, but uh, it's. It'll be interesting to see, and and striking that tariff deal with the US would kind of put to bed a lot of the Brexit woes as well. We've never really delivered Brexit. Uh, We've just caused a right old kerfuffle with the EU. We've got no real relationship with them. They hated the Conservative Party. They seem to like the Labour Party. Of course they do. It fits very much in with their own politics. Um, but but, But the Labour Party have have their hands tied because you know they don't have a mandate to go back to Europe and reconnect us as if we're members of the EU again and neither should they by the way so I'm not quite sure that how that ends up they're going to have to lean into the EU because that's what that's what they want to do and they're going to have to um, lean into the US as well and it's going to create this real weird juxtaposition of a meeting of politics which I'm not sure that we've seen because when when Trump was in before, of course we have Boris Johnson. You know, many would say our very own Donald Trump. Not not really, in my opinion, for for many many reasons, for many many reasons. And why he went on Channel Four last night and had the piss taken out of him for three hours, I'll never know. Some would say that he deserved it, um, but it was the only fun that Maitlis had all night. But it'd be mate, very interesting because we're going. Sorry, mate. We're just going. I, I, I make this long point. Yeah, no, it's good. You're actually on the. I'm. I'm still in party mode. You're on the serious geopolitics. Go on. Yeah, I just think that ultimately, you know, that's what we're going to look forward to, and there will be this weird juxtaposition of centre right, um, you know, every man politics of the US now, 
and this weird uh, communism, socialism light politics of Europe, uh, which wants to, you know, just tax everyone to death and spend all the money on asylum trans surgery. Yeah, it's very interesting because that's the old regime. And we can get into that because I really want to get into what this means for the regime and what Trump's victory, whether they're going to really assimilate Trump or whether he is really going to represent change. But I just want to say there's a few more meltdowns coming in. David Badil, uh -huh. might be time to accept that people are more energized by hate than hope. And he also goes, also that new media is more powerful than old. It just is. We agreed. And as it happens, really thrives on hate. David <laughs> if you start with that premise, you're just so lost. You just you're not gonna be able to see the wood for the trees because you've started with this idea that it's all hate, and which is just meaningless uh, to me, completely empty word in this context. I mean, I don't. I you look at Trump, you know, doing golf swings and dancing to YMCA. Everyone loves him. They're all having a great time. And you just go, oh, yeah, that, that's hate. It's just not hate, though, is it, David? You just called it hate, and and you're proceeding from there, and that's why you're completely lost because your fundamental assumptions are wrong. It's nothing. He's it's a confused like... man, David Badil. Let's face it, because. Donald Trump is on his side as a Jew. Yes. A hundred percent on his side as a Jew. And he would be much better off having Donald Trump in power in the States than he ever would um, Sleepy Joe or Crazy Kamala. Yeah, who only, who only pay lip service to Israel. But who on the have to pay side. lip service because, you know, that's what you have to do in the US. But yeah. Donald Trump means it. Yes. Um, and... I just think that people like David Badil find themselves in a trap, a trap they've set themselves because they say they make everything very, I, ironically, they make everything very binary. Everything else to these people has to be fluid, gender, whatever. Yeah. But when it comes to politics, it has to be absolutely binary. You know, this man bad, this woman good. That That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. So in this case, um, it was because Trump was totally good oh, man, and Kamala was he? totally bad. <laughs> but I know what you mean. It is mad, isn't it? If you're yes, if you're a Jewish person who is critical of Israel and you're just you're more of a lefty, you you identify you don't you don't make it your whole thing. But but deals pretty big on 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 his Jewish identity, so it is surprising. If you're any kind of Zionist or you're very big on Israel, of course you have to be pro Trump. And you just have to suck the rest up, as far as I can see. If that's your primary concern, but he doesn't. And that we're not was... going to change hearts and minds, Nick. If they were no. to watch this, they would consider us uh, bigoted, which, especially um... you. Yeah, you know, especially which, which is which. Yeah, the people's a big gamut. pig in the background. I've called I my I called uh I called my first daughter bigot. So yes, uh, bigot and, gammon is her full name. Bigot gammon Cox, yeah, yeah, which is which is a beautiful name, Nick. Beautiful name. Bigot Cox would be a confusing name. Um, by the way, Martin Maid has come in. You remember him? Darrell Cooper got in a lot of trouble on Tucker Carlson for his uh, World War Two. Some said revisionism. Uh, he goes twenty. Uh, 2008, Obama gets 69 million votes. 2016, Clinton gets 65 million votes. 2020, Biden gets 81 million votes. 2024, <laughs> Harris gets 66 million votes. 2020 was so obviously rigged. It was rigged, but this time they made it too big to rig, folks. It's called too big to rig. And um, there's so many things I still want to get into, Paul. I mean, you've gotten yeah, very got serious. Let's do it. Um, how time. long have we done? We don't, because I'm cause on this weird Zoom, it doesn't tell me the time, about 40 minutes. Well, couple of things. So here's what I'm really interested in. Will the regime... Now, has the regime accepted Trump or or what? So I had this... So I was somewhat influenced by academic agent, Dr. Nima Parvini, but I also believe this myself. And I don't. I can't give him all the credit, but I don't know when his thoughts started and mine ended because I, I absorbed so much stuff. But I've obviously been like pro-Trump since 2016. And I've obviously... And before that, when he was a, a so such a great host of The Apprentice. But... um. But I've I've said Trump will win this the whole time, and I've never wavered, as I said, and I've been completely right. But his theory and my theory, basically, is that Trump has been somewhat accepted by core aspects of the regime. And actually, you could see this in all the newspaper columns, and that Har Harris, they never wanted. And I think this is clear. Obama said, well, we'll have to have a, an open and fair process. And it's like, it's Kamala. What? And even Obama <laughs> seemed to be, from what we could tell, sort of, you know, he was sort of hoodwinked by it. He was like... We've gone with Kamala, but she's shit. You know, he thought there'd be a proper thing, but everyone just immediately endorsed Hillary, immediately endorsed Kamala. And people thought, will Hillary go for it? Will Michelle go for it? Would Gavin Newsom is there? You know, and Biden hated Kamala and just seemed to constantly do things to undermine her, wearing a MAGA hat, 
the garbage thing was perhaps accidental. He's but the that second be... happiest man in the USA today, by <laughs> yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Easily. Na- yeah, yeah, yeah. People are saying like natural friends forced to be enemies with some of the memes. It's so funny. But yeah, Biden didn't want Harris. You look at it and go, yeah, the regime just didn't seem to want Harris. And this is why I was very much on the side of Trump will win and there won't be this freak out. There won't be the violence on the streets. The, the, the sort of conventional wisdom was that there would be. I said there wouldn't be. And I always allow, because I'm a bit superstitious, to, but in, they can always rig it. Because you never know. They're so crazy. They can yeah. always do the rig. Because you've been hurt once. You don't want to get burned again. You know, you know they can rig it. So you're just like, uh but, but I didn't think they really would. I thought this was pretty much how it would go. But I didn't let myself fully believe it. And it has gone this way. Because no one wanted Harris. And here's another little thing I'll give you about Harris, Paul, that I just learned from boxing. When I watch boxing, and I'm a big boxing fan, and I think the commentators never give enough weight to the unprecedented the unprecedented act of beating an undefeated fighter. So when Uzik's fighting people, you go, I've watched Uzik. I've watched, and sorry, this will, for the non-boxing fans, I'll bring this back. Don't, don't you worry. Uzik is an extraordinary boxer. I watched all his fights at, yeah. at, at, at mm-hmm. Cruiser, uh, Cruiser, Cruiserweight. And um, I was like, so, so I'm, like, I'm as tired as you. So my mind suddenly went, is it called Cruiserweight, Nick? And I just, it sent me into a big, is, yeah. freak out. But I've watched all his fights and I was like, no one's even knocked this guy down. This guy's unbelievable. Then he moves up to heavyweight and he wins all those. And the only time it was really hard to call was when Tyson Fury fought him because he was also undefeated. But when I'm watching it and going, hang on, you've got to beat Uzik. You're saying Joshua's going to beat him. Really? He's undefeated. I've never seen him even hurt. And that's the second time. Oh, he's going to beat him now. Is he? And you're just like, this guy's undefeated. So here's my point, my analogy. Kamala Harris was trying to be the first female president. That is a hard thing to do. Because it's like that old cliche about the four-minute mile. Once it was broken, suddenly everyone did it. Now, there are fake glass ceilings, like Rachel Reeves, I'm the first female chancellor, all this stuff. That is a fake glass ceiling. Why? Because although it's statistically less likely that women are into economics, you've got basically Starmer picking it, and they're obsessed with diversity. So it's it's already rigged because you're just like, well, we'll have her. Oh, it is an achievement of sorts because it's... It wasn't at all cost, though, was it? It wasn't against all odds. No. It's just, to me, a much lesser achievement. But to be... And because it's picked by fake people, by the regime, it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's on the face of it, is it's managed. It's like, yes, I'll pick you. When the people have to pick the first female president, that is very different because the people, as we've seen, are still not completely brainwashed. So that's a very difficult thing to achieve. Hillary Clinton couldn't achieve it. She's about the most in the system, likely person. She wasn't liked, but it would be hard for anyone. Tulsi would have a chance because she's much more likable and just seems a much better candidate. People say Michelle Obama would have a chance. That's actually a hard thing to do. So what were the chances that the weakest candidate possibly in history of any sex was going to do it? It was always incredibly slim and it was always impossible to me. So a couple of things that, but also the bigger question, I ramble for a bit there, of how far was this, how far was, how, how far has the regime accepted Trump? And is that what we saw with this? They essentially just said, yeah, he's going to be better We'll just adapt some things and, and just accept the Trump era. So with regards to the regime, if we just take the GOP, the Republican Party, um, in the first instance, they I'm not sure they've ever accepted him. He's changed them. If you think about what the Republican Party looked like in 2015, 2016, it was just full of country club boys, you know, uh, that, that, that ran the states or, you know, ran their individual states very comfortably and lived just as you'd imagine in your mind's eye how a, how a wealthy, white, upper-middle-class American guy w- w- would run their state, you know, with all the backhanders, etc. He's changed what the Republican Party looks like and basically built it in his own image. A little bit like God with Earth, I think, Nick. And... Um, uh, maybe a step too far. I don't yeah, know. You're right. Some is a lot uh, like we, we, he's not God. We can't be blasphemous, but he is the greatest man, <laughs> except for Jesus. He is the greatest man to have ever walked the earth. So a, a little bit, as like I said, just in case. But um, so from that perspective, no, he's changed them, and they now accept him because he is, you know, the leader of the Trump version of the Republican Party, the overall sort of uni party type system that sits above. Um, the politics in America and obviously across the world, have they accepted him? I think much like you, you, the case you really made was that Kamala Harris was so weak, they had no choice but to. In some respects, and I'm going to be quite generous to Kamala Harris now, it was very unfair 
for the whole of the Democratic Party to or, or the American electorate to say, this is our greatest chance, you know, a, 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 a woman of colour, and and just choose the worst pile of crap. And to put her in so late, politics. by the way, just sorry, and to put her in so late, she had yeah, barely any time. Yeah, six days or something. She, she she didn't stand a chance, absolutely didn't stand, wasn't the right candidate, didn't have any of the requisite skills to carry out the task, and um, was part of a coup, I'll still stand by that, uh, to, to, to push out her predecessor, because he could have gone a long time before all that. They put him in front of Trump and Trump like the floor of him. Completely, it was embarrassing. Um, so they lied to us. They lied to themselves. They lied to us. And then they put in Kamala Harris and they kept lying to say that she was the best candidate. She was not at all. Meanwhile, what Trump did was build his own version of the system, which is now Trump, Musk, Culty Tabard, um, Joe Rogan. You know, Tulsi, Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just made up. I think I just made a name up in my head. Honestly, I don't know what day it is. Are we still talking about the Trump election? This isn't Kemi Bates. You're obviously. not used to staying up all night like me, Paul. I feel bad. No, I I'm just not. starting to kick I'm in definitely now. Definitely not. I, was, I, took, I, I didn't even realise I'd taken such a gamble on a name, but I know exactly what I meant. Um, <laughs> you've got you've got uh, Bobby Kenny Junior. I mean, these yeah. these you know go go and make American healthy again. Leave the oil to me," he said. "Did you hear him? Leave the oil to me. We got yeah. liquid gold out there, and he's and you know he's going to turn that into improving the economy. I'm sure. So they've had to accept him because a he's the best candidate, and b there has never been a tour de force in democratic politics like it. There's yeah. been tour de forces in other types of politics, of which Donald Trump is not, and I'm not even going to do it. The the service of mentioning what what others of of you know those shadows that they've cast upon Trump, it's all absolute nonsense, and it's absolutely uh, completely and utterly offensive to all the people that were victims of the Nazis, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They should hang their heads in shame. Really, that's one thing they should walk away with. That hanging their heads in is um, those utterly repugnant comparisons with fascist regimes. There was nothing fascistic really about Donald Trump. You can take the things that he said and make it sound like whatever you want because he says a lot of stuff, uh, but there, there is no evidence to back up the the fascism. I know we saw all. ITV and it, Channel Four, and all these people are sticking with that and just go, "Oh, the, the fascist language of it's like." You guys really need to pull your heads out of your asses to use an American phrase and just stop going on about that because it's just meaningless. Yeah, Trump says a few wild things. I mean, I'd love him to be a dictator, as I've said, but he just isn't. He's a, basically a liberal. He's basically a liberal who likes tariffs, which is, you know, slightly against his economic liberalism. But it's just like, he, he, you know, and with the, with the Musk era, we're not even in the Bannon era of economic nationalism. We're in the Musk era of high school immigration and we're in a sort of libertarian Trump. It, it's nothing like it. he governed as a kind of centre left liberal with a few quirks. I mean, it's so, so it's so crazy. And yet the previous Trump term you can all look at, but that didn't seem to make any difference to their ironic minds. That was also, um, I mean, the first year or two of that was just hilarious, wasn't it? It was a it was a bit like you and I becoming president. He was kind of like wandering around the White House thinking, oh, my God, this is like it looks on the TV, and then realising he, he, had, he had to do all these Beautiful things. Beautiful room, the Lincoln bedroom. You know, and Trump, Rogan was talking about the bed when he first yeah. got in. Low chairs. Yeah, yeah, and Rogan's like, yeah, yeah, but you're president suddenly. Isn't that weird? He's like, Beautiful bedroom. <laughs> Um, he went on a proper wander with that one, didn't he? I'm not sure he ever came back to where he should have done. The we, we call it the we, to, go on. With regards to the regime, uh, I don't think yeah, they have I, accepted him. Okay, I I've think got more on that. Go on. He's created his own version of the regime and he's crowbarred it into the American system. Because sitting way, way above that, whatever you want to call it, Illuminati, um, One World Vision, WEF, all of these ridiculously and quite terrifying regimes that do exist, they're not accepting Donald Trump. Donald Trump has beaten them today. That's what's happened. Yeah, that's really interesting how far they'll have to bend the knee. Because here's the thing. So if you follow elite theory, as some do who follow this channel, the teachings of people like Mosca and Pareto that people like Nima Parvini have sort of brought to a, a wider audience recently, and it is quite convincing stuff. You look into it and you go, one of the key facets is called the circulation of elites. So you need to circulate in new talent. And 
if you don't, you become ossified, you become brittle, and you fail because you 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 can't circulate in that time. If you look at the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, what did they fail to do? They failed to assimilate RFK Jr., who's from the most elite American family possible. If that guy, who's like a sort of American hero type of guy from the Kennedy, whose you know uncle was JFK, dynasty. his dad was Bobby Kennedy. If that guy can't get into your party, you are fucked. I mean, and he was so disillusioned that he joined Trump and got his substantial following to join Trump and his running mate, uh, Nicole Shanahan. She said that the Democrats had destroyed her belief in the, their fair and free democracy. I mean, that is bad. If you get hardcore Democrats with, from the, you know, with that kind of history of, of being a part of the Democrat Party to say you've just completely disillusioned us, that is a huge own goal. And you just go, OK, you guys couldn't adapt at all and you had to fail. So what an elite does if it's smart is it adapts and it says, OK, we have to change a little bit because the people are not accepting this anymore. And we've got to make a kind of change. And this is what Trump represents. He represents a counter elite. Trump's an elite figure himself. RFK, as I've said, is an elite figure. Oh, yeah. Musk is the richest man in the world. So it's a counter elite. So it does look a lot like that. And you go, OK, they've been smart enough. Someone behind the scenes, the the orga- maybe just the whole organic thing of the elite itself has gone. We need to adapt to this. Not, not everyone. Lots of people are still freaking out and calling them fascists and all this. Lots of idiots in the media. But they're low level players. The elite seems to have had accepted this because there was no other choice, as you say. And by the way, look how, look how. So we talk about a circulation of elites not bringing in new talent. I think, yeah, yeah. Why aren't I? Uh, why aren't I part of it? But we're talking about the richest man in the world who wants to go to Mars and make spaceships is not allowed in it. He's had to leave the Democrats. Look at the team they had to assemble. It's extraordinary. If you're going to not let in Elon Musk, RFK Jr. Tulsi Gabbard, these people are all alienated from, they were all Democrats and they've all come across. Some of them are literally standing as Democrats and some of them were just voting Democrat. It's extraordinary. And you've alienated all these people so thoroughly. So the only way they could survive these people is to say, yeah, okay, Trump's, we've got to, we've got to accept the Trump era. And this is what presumably, who knows how it works, but presumably the deep state people just have to accept Trump and work with him now because otherwise it was death. Absolutely. We've not mentioned him yet too much. J.D. Vance. What an impressive guy that, that guy's proven to be. And I think Absolutely. he's going to make um, a very impressive vice president. And maybe is the, you know, the, the guy that Donald Trump hands over to and he runs with. He was an impressive part of Donald Trump's campaign. And he said in his speech, Donald Trump, he would just send J.D. Vance into all sorts of media interviews, essentially on the opposition side of the media, you know, CNN etc cetera, etc cetera. and he went in and he would often smash it out the park yeah and absolutely. he won he won people over lots of people on both sides were saying this is an impressive guy and they tried to they tried to kick him down very early on but it feels like we've only seen maybe a small percentage of his capability and he's going to become someone who's very impressive i think yeah he's not going to be i mean you never do see much of the vice president but you think of the last two vice presidents we've seen one of them has just run against Donald Trump and has proven to be an abject failure, and quite honestly. And the other one was Mike Pence. Um, I don't know what to say about Mike Pence. I mean, he just existed in the background. He was uh, nothing but... in character. Waltz was terrible, as you say. Like, why did she not pick Josh Shapiro? No one understood that. It was very odd. Waltz was terrible, kind of nothing character. The, camo, the nothing. camo hats, by the way, that Vance came out with, the sort of, I, I don't even know what they said on them, you know, make. Kamala believable again. I don't know what they said on them, but they saw this as a major, a major part of their campaign. We've got people wearing camo hats, like that's come countering you mean the, yeah, Waltz. So that he was behind this camo hat thing, and you saw them all last night. I don't know if you saw them. And I'm thinking, is that what he contributed? He contributed <laughs> two things. Then I brought the One hat. Is, <laughs> he, he got the hat, and he was convinced that children should be able to have their chin, their genitals chopped off. And, and and he made the whole transgender debate uh, very much a, a democratic, you know, tent pole. And we, we know that doesn't work. And we know that we know the reason it doesn't work is because a very small percentage of people are interested in that. And most people it alienates. And then the rest of people are like, no, no, thank you, even on both sides. So you do find a lot of people forced to believe a number of things because they decided that politics is binary and what um and what trump has uh, has quite clearly proven 
during this during this race by pulling together his own team of Avengers, the Trump Avengers. He, he you know, whatever you want to call them, Charlie's Trump's angels. He he's been able to he's been able to put, cobble this lot together from all different political backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, a few things on that. I mean, that the I'll well, I'll talk about Vance first. Vance, I said was I mean, look, I hate to big myself up, as you know, I said it was a great choice. Everyone's like, oh, he won't work against Kamala. You know, that's nonsense. And I actually have mutual friends with Vance, so I'm like oh, one wow. degree from the from Vance. I'm actually, <laughs> mind you, I already know Jason Miller, so I'm one degree from Trump already. I, I'm very close to the... the, the, yeah, the essentially, the you're, you're nearly... You're, if if Farage falls ill, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're the person on like, the Smart cookie, <laughs> that great guy, GB News. Um, anyway... <laughs> Check out his podcast. Uh, anyway, the point is, Vance, yeah, super smart. And Vance, with his high IQ, sort of reminds me a little bit of uh, our friend Andrew Doyle. You know, the way he can go in so unflustered and his sentences all come out perfect. Yeah. That's that's high IQ. And also, he is someone who actually understands the new right, sometimes called the dissonant right, because he's he's friends with people like Curtis Yarvin. So it's quite interesting to have him in there, a guy who grasps this. And he he understands things like elite theory. So the question is, Will he get in there and shake up the deep state? Because he, I've said this before, but he is someone who understands this quote that came from the Reagan administration, that personnel is policy. So where Trump was completely bamboozled the first time and brought in idiots like John Bolton, as he discussed on the Rogan podcast, Vance yeah. will be like, right, we've got to get the right guys in here. And I think he'll be very serious on that. And the idea they tried to call him weird, the Theo Vaughn interview proved conclusively he's not weird. By the way, I've supported Theo Vaughn on tour, but that's another story. Um, he's not weird. He's very smart. He's very normal. And to get where he got from his background, the guy has to be virtually a superhero. In that sense, he's not normal. He's abnormally talented. If you watch Hillbilly Elegy or read the book, it's extraordinary. You know, mother, a heroin addict, just no money, just craziness, just sort of full on food stamp chaos. And he's just come from that to vice president. It's, it's unbelievable. He, and and, and a, a straight white man in 2024, as you know, Paul, you, you have to have pure merit. You have to have like extra. You have to do everything 10 times. Oh, because you will be held back at all costs. So they, they they tried to have a go at this guy, but he was pure straight white male excellence. And just something on the team, the team that Trump had to assemble, what really showed it was that last political campaign ad. You had Trump's ad and you had Kamala's ad. And uh, that guy, Frank Lutz, Lutz, whatever his name is, put them back to back. And you go, oh, yeah, the Trump one actually was so, it was the best political ad I've ever seen. It was like, hey, let's cut to Trump. Oh, now let's go over to Tulsi. Oh, let's now go over to RFK. Oh, What's Elon Musk up to? Oh, here's Vance at home. And it was like going to each of them. Oh, here's Vivek. It was going to each of them like characters in a I movie you're about Vivek, to watch. Yeah, yeah I He's forgot Vivek. It. Or like at your favorite series. It was so brilliantly done because they've probably got these libs on board now who are good at that kind of thing. They've got the yeah. RFK type people. And it was so brilliantly done. And then back to back with Kamala's, you saw straight away, oh, it's one person. It's her droning on for ages. She's meeting people and saying insincere things to them. You know, it's just nonsense. It's boring. It's low energy. It's dull. And it doesn't get over the fundamental problem that she's been in for the last four years. She goes, oh, the, the costs are too high. This is too high. This is like, that was you. So she had no time. Yeah. You, you look at that, you're, she's got nothing. She's got nothing. Whereas you're just like, hey, let's see. Oh, Trump's, v Musk is launching rockets. Vance is doing this. It's like, it was extraordinary. And, but one thing that really bothers me, last point on this, and this is a, it's a fairly whimsical point, but Trump had to be so good to win. I mean, he did absolutely crush it and win everything, as we've said. But yeah. imagine how good he had to be. He had to be the most famous guy in the world ever. He had to have the richest man in the world. He had to have uh, John F. Kennedy's nephew. He had to have Tulsi Gabbard. He had to have Vivek Ramaswamy. He had to have such extraordinary talent to go up against the whole media machine. And you still had all this, oh, hey, oh, he's evil, blah, blah. You still had all that nonsense. But you look, you have to, you had to like really just give it everything. And that's just to, to win. And he did win pretty comfortably. But imagine having it's just extraordinary that what you're up against. You're up against the entire uh, system. Although, though, that now may over the next four years start to change, which we can discuss. But any comment on any of that, this rambling from me? Yeah, it'd be interesting. I think this time, I don't think we can undervalue the part that Elon Musk played and what he's done with X. Now, now it's actually yeah, uh, something of an accusation that's thrown in from the left. Evil. Uh, X is uh, propagating far-right hatred 
just enables me and you to go on there and shout at minorities and get laughing emoji responses. That's, I think that's the way the left just see, just see people like me and you go and they go, oh, brown people are horrible. And then loads of other people like us go, yeah, you're absolutely right. What a load of old horseshit. I, I mean, there probably is an element of that, but there'd be an element of that, whatever you did. It's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. You know, uh, not our problem, not what we're planning to do. So what he was able to do was actually ring fence uh, that public communication or that market square that just hasn't been ring fenced for some time. And it, what it enabled is that level of debate to take place, a free speech social media outlet. And it enabled voices that would support Trump to flourish and be seen uh, for the co coherent, intelligent voices that they are and all that they became. And I think that enabled um, the sort of, let's just, you know, let's just, let's just take white men or men of young men, any colour you like. Um, Joe Rogan podcast. I mean, goodness only knows how many viewers he has per, per episode. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions probably. Um, only 23% of them are female or 29% of them, I forget what the figures are. Um, but obviously a good 70 odd percent of them are young men. And it was able, they were able to see him. They could forget everything they've been told. They could forget the adverts. They could forget CNN. They could forget anything the left wanted them to see. And they could just see him. And they went, that's my guy. Because... By comparison to, to this other person over here that keeps droning on about colour of skin and genitals and all the other nonsense that no one actually cares about, he was able to talk about the economy. He was able to talk, he was able to hold his own with Joe Rogan, who has interviewed everyone on earth, and um, still do absolutely fine, not embarrass himself, come across quite strong. Um, and we there is going to be a debt of gratitude that's owed to Elon Musk for that. Absolutely. And... Um... Just on that point, Paul, and just to end the uh, free podcast, um, Musk has written, the reality of this election was plain to see on X. While most legacy media lied relentlessly to the public, you are the media now. And, and that is exactly what we saw over right. the night. We just saw X telling the truth, the media melting down, lying, mateless swearing, ITV asking insulting questions, getting sworn at. And that was just in England. Who knows what it was like in America? It must have been way worse. Yeah. I would have thought so. X, X, you are the media now, Paul. It means you... And all you guys watching, part of the new media. We're part of the new media. We are the new media. Yeah. Fuck the old media. We're coming for you. <laughs> we're like Bannon. We're coming. Retribution starts now. We're not good people. We're going to come for you. I yeah. want to be just like Steve Bannon without any of the legal problems. Just no, want without legal problems, but with the tan and the hair. Yeah. Oh, man. The good hair. hair. Good hair. Well, I wouldn't swap livers with him. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell you what, Paul, if you can stick around, that would be great. Also a little bit more. I know you're very tired. We're all tired. It's been it's been a long night. But I want to talk about the future of uh, woke and whether wokeness will be sort of put on the back back burner in the new maggot era, which is which is one of my theories. But first, tell all the good people where they can find you. So you can find me at Paul Cox Comedy on all platforms, particularly on Twitter. That's if you like this version of me, then follow me on Twitter because I'm much less political on Facebook because I run a set of comedy clubs called Epic Comedy and Facebook enables me to promote uh, the, the comedy clubs and myself. And, you, you know, you've got to be very careful on Facebook. So if you like a, sort of a satirical, a comedic, political version of Paul Cox, then Twitter is the place to find me at Paul Cox Comedy. And, of course, on Headliners, where Paul is yeah. still on. Not as much as he should be, but he is still on. So uh, yeah, Headliners, 11 p.m. on GB News. But, unfortunately, it's, it's it's random nights, and you never know when each person's going to be on. Not quite but... at the moment. No, next back on Saturday. So if people are watching this on probably Thursday or Friday, I'm next back on Saturday night. Okay. And, of course, go to nickdixon.net for the full version of this podcast and all my other podcasts and all my articles, which are frankly excellent. And um, yeah. it's only five quid a month, which is, what is that? It's nothing, really. We'll get nothing. you probably, like, what, half a coffee in a... It won't be anything um, within a, a few more months of Starmer and Reeves, will it? More inflation. Yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> five quid a month, or it's even cheaper for the year, on Substack, nickdixon.net. Much appreciated, and help us save the West. 
and we'll see you on there. And uh, if you want the full version, go to nicktings.net now. Otherwise, we'll see you on YouTube. And sorry for the lack of regularity of the podcast. I'm now trying to put out short videos as well, but you'll see me around. And uh, thanks very much, Paul.